Hi, I'm Scott Williams. I'm with the Augusta Home Builders Association. Joining us today, we've got two folks. We've got John Carter, who is with Rockingham Ready Mix um, and their group. Um, and Rockingham Ready Mix has been a member of Augusta Home Builders for many years. So we appreciate your continued membership. And then we've got um, Keith Will with Superior Concrete. He is their VP of Operations. And Superior is a new member. They joined uh, the end of last year. So thank you for being a member. Um, Thanks for having us. Yeah, and so we're delighted to see if we can um, answer some of these questions. So as a builder, um, I always, I know that everything I do starts with the foundation and foundations are always, they're made out of concrete, right? So we start with footings and we've got our walls, whether they're uh, concrete block or whether they're cord walls, and then we've got our slabs and, you know, inevitably, as in the month of February, we're dealing with, um, you know, difficult weather sometimes, cold weather, wet weather, frozen weather, um, and I'm, I'm, I never feel like I know for sure what the right procedure is. Mm. Um, so I, you know, what I would love to try and understand is when we get into working in cold weather, um, I mean, when, when is it cold enough that we need to start taking steps to ensure what we do um, isn't compromised, you know, doesn't doesn't crack, doesn't cause structural problems. Technically, uh, ACI states that it's 40 degrees for any length of period of time below 40 degrees. Um, that had changed. It was con three consecutive days, um, but now it's it's just um, it's during a period of time. You know that it gets 40 or below. You know the definition of um, cold weather. The ACI. American Concrete Institute definition of cold weather is three consecutive days with an average temperature below 40 degrees. So in a 24 hour period, the high and the low, the average, three days in a row below 40 degrees, you're technically in cold weather. So you have to put into place cold weather concreting practices. Now, like you said, this time of year, every day is, is cold and you really should you know, be taking proper steps to protect the concrete. Um, as as ReadyMix producers, um, we are at, back at the plant taking the steps to make sure that um, we're following the, the proper concreting steps, maintaining minimal um, temperatures for as delivered concrete. On the site, some of the things that need to be occurring are um, concrete not placed on frozen ground. That's always a no-no. Um, and anything you can do to raise the temperature um, in the placement site. If it's a slab on grade, try to get the temperature up above that um, 40 degrees, whether it's just by the use of blankets um, or supplemental heat to get that temperature up. We don't want to pour on frozen ground. We don't want to pour on ground. We really don't want to pour on ground that's not uh, above 40 degrees. You know, so we can accomplish that with the sun, um, letting it thaw out a little bit before we schedule a pour. We can use blankets um, over the area we're going to pour. Um, when after the concrete goes down, right? The, so uh, as I understand it, there's a chemical reaction that goes on that generates heat, right? That helps with the curing process, right? That provides some temperature, but but when you pour in a cold weather and at nights, we clearly get below freezing. You know, so when are when should we be putting blankets on top of the the finished product to help it cure overnight and, and over a couple of day period if we're going to be uh, in cold weather? Immediately, as soon as the finishing process is has been done um, and a curing any curing that may have been done, if whether it's a liquid uh, curing membrane or whatever. As soon as it's done, get that heat trapped in there and, uh, and maintain, hold that, hold that heat. Um, at least over the next three days, and depends on what the ambient temperature is over the next week, it may take a little longer. So, so really th three days, you know, if you're in a period of extreme cold, you really want to keep it covered for three days before you... That heat, that, that hydration uh, process is going on, that concrete is, is continuing to make its its own heat for uh, a little while, You're generally within three days. But it's starting to, each day is starting to get less and less. 
Um, if you pour it and, and it's a beautiful day the next day and it's going to get up 50, 60 degrees, you might want to pull those blankets back off of it, let the sun come out, get the heat of the day, cover it right back up. Um, so, yeah, John? You... Well, like you said, the, the hydration of cement is an exothermic process. It releases heat, so that heat can be your friend. The, um, the two things, the, the most critical things with pouring concrete in cold weather are one, don't let it freeze. Concrete will freeze, the water in the concrete will freeze at around 25 degrees. Um, once that happens, um, as the ice crystals form and they expand, they are stronger um, at about, in that early process, in that plastic concrete, they are stronger than the cement hydration. So you can effectively shut off the hydration of the cement and stop the gain of strength in concrete um, to the tune of about a 50% strength loss if you allow it to freeze. Um, so that's the main thing. Don't, don't allow that concrete to freeze. Is there a temperature that's too low to pour concrete? Not necessarily. I mean, in the northern climates in Canada and other places, around the world, they pour concrete year round. As long as you're taking those effective steps, you can pour concrete in, in really any kind of cold temperature. Um, one of the things that I've always um, struggled to understand is the different types of additives that people can use or people do use um, to, to um, assist with cold weather pouring. Um, and, and I've all often wondered you know, are there any adverse effects of using those? Does it does it um, does it stain um, the concrete? Does it make it weaker? So, um, tell me, you know, what are additives that that are good to use <clears throat> that we should use? And then, are there any? I mean, do we risk um, the finished product at all affecting it? Um, there are two types of accelerators: um, salt chloride based, like calcium chloride and um, non-chloride accelerators. Um, using chloride-based accelerators is perfectly fine as long as you don't use more than 2% of, uh, of that solution. Um, and as long as there's no, of the, yeah, the 2% of the cement content. And that there's um, no steel involved. I mean, that the salt will corrode the steel. So if there's steel in your slab on grade or steel in your poured wall, you want to avoid using um, calcium chloride and then use one of the non-chloride accelerators. They're very effective. Both of them are very effective and have been used for a lot of years. They are not um, antifreezes. You know, you can't just put it in there and forget about it. You still have to follow those good concreting practices. And do, do they do, other than the potential reaction with steel, is, is there any adverse, does it weaken the slab or the footing or the, the concrete at all by using those? You can get some discoloration, uh, especially if calcium chloride is, is used. Sometimes you can get that. Um, a lot of times we see um, delamination or discoloration um, when people are covering. There's a, there's a chemical reaction and you might be able to help remember and tell me what, exactly what it is, but there is a chemical reaction uh, a, with, with poly sheets and the hydration process that sometimes you can get some of that discoloration. And that's more from it than it is really um, from the calcium, but you can get some discoloration with calcium. Yeah, and it, it, it's more of an issue really with colored concrete, architectural concretes, um, you know, for your typical home builder, um, a, color, a little bit of color discoloration is not going to be a problem. Typically they aren't structural. Yes, they can be unsightly, but um, as long as you're not using too much, you know, the, using that 2% um, limit, um, you shouldn't have any problem with any structure. Um, and, and this is kind of a, uh, maybe an, an out of the uh, category question, but um, there, are, there are different types of concrete used in different circumstances, right? So if you're pouring concrete that's gonna be in direct contact with the ground, mm -hmm. um, you wanna have, you, you make, air is mixed into that, right? To help it expand and contract. Correct, freeze thrall. 
protection. Anything exposed to weather should have air entrainment in it. So right. like sidewalks, Correct. patios, porches, where you're gonna be in contact with air and ground water. Correct, um, garage slabs, basement slabs, not necessary. The jury's still kinda out on, on foundation walls because they're vertical. Um, and um, you know, so it's, a lot of times it's not just laying, laying there, you know, your weather and everything. So um, that's, that's, they do put air in walls, but that is, you know, like I say, the jury's still kind of out on whether it really needs to be, you know. And, and when um, we order the concrete or our trade partner who's pouring our footings or, or slab, whatever, orders the concrete, um, is it that time where, where we talk to the plant and say, hey, look, we're pouring um, sidewalks today. Well, they, they'll know when we tell them what it is we want it for, whether we need to add air. Sure. Sure, and uh, I think most codes, I'm not 100% on Augusta County, but it needs to be at least 3,500, 3,500, 4,000, um, no less than 3,500 on, on uh, outside concrete, you know? Uh, and now as I kind of look out the window and, and February is on its way out, um, it has been a challenging month to pour concrete for sure because of the because of the weather, because of the, the snow and the cold. Um, we'll pretty soon be uh, talking about the opposite and we'll be battling the heat when we're pouring concrete, which sounds a little kind, kind of counterintuitive if you worry about pouring it in the cold. You know, why do we even worry about pouring concrete in the heat? <clears throat> well, let's not jump over the fun of springtime concrete. <laughs> Um, right. what, where typically we start getting some lower humidity days um, and s some wind um, blowing, your slab on grade, um, we have to protect um, for cracking and I'm sure we'll, we'll have a chance to talk about some of the cracking issues. But typically spring and fall are the times of year that you get the most complaints for slab cracking. It can happen anytime, but that's typically when, when you see the worst of uh, cracking issues. Well, while we're talking about cracking, um, I mean, that's, I mean, that's the, <clears throat> that's the, obviously the number one complaint you get probably from sure. builders, from homeowners. And, and they look at it and they say, well, my slab, my garage slab is cracked. Um, my sidewalk's cracked. Um, you know, is that a problem? And, and I ask that question. The first thing that our trades do when they pour a slab, you know, after it's cured enough to get on it is they cut it. To cut a pattern in it, right, to direct where it cracks. So it almost seems by definition that concrete is meant to crack. Absolutely. Right? But it, it's where it cracks, uh, and then the, I guess the type of cracks. <coughs> that, that exactly. There are many types of cracks, and you think about it when you place concrete, when it first comes out of the ready mix truck, it's at its largest volume. There's a lot of excess water in concrete. We call it water of convenience. Concrete. The cement in the concrete needs very little of the water that's actually there. So when you pour it, a lot of that water has to come out. So you've got this big slab on grade with all the friction from the aggregates at the bottom. So differential shrinkage, I mean, it's drying more on top and it's moving more on top than it is on the bottom. And a lot of that caused some internal stresses that sometimes can be greater than the young concrete's ability to resist them, and that's when you get cracking. You're right, there's lots of, there's plastic shrinkage, drying shrinkage, thermal shrinkage. There's different types of, yeah, the shrinkage that, that can Settlement. occur. Right, and, and a lot of it is all, um, it's, it's typically all referred to as plastic shrinkage because a lot of it happens when the concrete is plastic. There's some settlement cracks and some other things that can happen after the concrete is hardened, but most of the callbacks that you probably get and that we, pro that we do get <clears throat> are referred to as plastic shrinkage cracks. Some of the steps that you can take, um, it's like Keith was talking about in cold weather concrete, plastic sheets. Um, I always tell finishers, try to under finish and over cure. <clears throat> you know, try to limit the amount of time that you're actually working the surface and then get that curing compound or the blanket or plastic sheet on as, as quickly as you can. Let's do all we can to help hold that moisture in the, in the top of the concrete. 
When you see VDOT pour a bridge deck, <clears throat> the first thing they do is come out, flood it, and then put their wet burlap on top of it, and then put their plastic over top of it. They're trying to keep that um, surface moist as long as they can because the longer, the more water we give to the concrete, the more cement can hydrate, the better off we all are. The stronger that the concrete's gonna be, the stronger that surface where all the wear is gonna take place can be. So that's one thing that we need to do is protect that surface. Um, now, flooding the concrete and letting it dry, going out the next day and flooding the concrete and letting it dry and going out the next day, you're, you're creating some more stresses on there that will sometimes lead to some of that crazy cracking. If you're gonna flood it, go ahead and cover it and, and leave it there as long as you can. In my house, in my uh, garage, they poured the concrete in spring. We didn't move in till fall. That concrete stayed covered until we were ready to move in. And to this day, I don't have a single joint in my concrete garage slab. Not ideal, there's not a crack in it. <clears throat> so um, there's certainly steps that you can take to, um, to protect your concrete and get you there. So you mentioned a curing compound, right? So I, I know I've certainly seen when curb and gutter, when you're, when you're pouring something that VDOT is inspecting, um, it seems to me that, it, that that's a requirement that curb and, that, that, it, that it's a curing compound is mm -hmm. sprayed on. Correct. I mean, mm -hmm. should you do the same thing for slabs? I mean, is there a benefit to that? Absolutely. Curing is, as, as John said there, curing, I like seeing guys use evaporation stabilizers uh, as they're pouring, so they put it down. You want to bull float it, or you want to you want to screed it off. You want to bull float it as quickly as possible. Um, you want to get it sealed up, start to let it bleed and everything. But then you want to you want to get evaporation stabilizer on it. And what that does is that just slows down the top from drying. Okay, and and it allows the concrete to set from within up, you know. And what happens is the con the wind, the sun's beating down, and and it, it's it concrete is measured in compressive strength, not tensile strength. It needs tensile strength going from its uh, plastic stage to its hardened stage. This is where fiber mesh comes in. John used to sell fiber, you know. Uh, this, is, this is where fiber mesh, and what that does is it's giving it that tensile strength because it's intermingled there, and it's giving it that tensile strength it needs to get from the plastic state to its hardened state to get it through that hump. It's not foolproof, it's not foolproof. But then after it's done and, and, you've, and, and the concrete set up curing, is, he's, he's it. You know, don't overwork the concrete, but just cure the heck out of it. That that is the the life of it. And there's he touched on it. There's the liquid membrane. There's burlap. You know, uh, wet and burlap. Uh, you can flood it. You can, but you really need to keep the water on it. You know, I, I tell folks, put your water hose on it and 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 sprinkle and just leave it leave it set. You know, for hours and shut it off and then go back out and turn if you have that ability and, and sometimes new construction you don't have that so. well yeah we're all we're f fighting schedules sure and, and absolutely we're fighting you know days of the week I, i've often heard people say you know that that if um you're pouring a slab and you've got a light rain that follows you know that evening you know that's one of the best things for it i guess i understand that now yep. um, i've also heard them say that you know on windy days in the spring or in the summer um that is really tough on them because you get surface cracking and I guess it's it's just evaporating mm -hmm. faster because of the wind and the heat than what's going on below it. Correct. What bleed, when you pour um, concrete, um, the plastic concrete, what's happening is the, the aggregates, the heavy stuff in that mix, are settling. As they settle, they're, they're pushing up the lighter stuff, which in this case is the water. That's what bleed water is. <clears throat> A concrete finisher knows He's watching the slab. When he sees it begin to dry out, um, he knows it's time to get on it with his finishing machine. And that's about 500 PSI. That's what we refer to as initial set. And that's about the point where a finisher standing on that slab, it will support his weight. That's right about 500 PSI. Um, the problem is though on a, on a, on a windy day, and, and ACI describes hot weather as a combination of high temperature, high winds, low humidity. It's more, it's not really temperature specific, right. kind of like cold weather is. It's more the climatic 
conditions. As that bleed water's coming up, he's waiting for it to begin to dry out to get on top of it. Well, as if the wind's blowing, or if the evaporation rate is greater off the surface, he misreads that as now it's time to get on it. So he gets on there and starts running his trowel, sealing the finish, but the, the bleed water's still trying to come up. And it, it, it comes up and gets caught, trapped at that surface, and that's when you start having issues with blistering, which is probably another um, issue that, that you run into. Uh, kind of a philosophy that we've said over the years, if it's a good day to go fishing, it's a bad day to pour concrete, you know? You better be paying attention what you're doing out there when you're pouring those things because the sun's out and it's warm and there's a nice breeze. Uh, you want to be on the lake or down by the stream. and <laughs> uh, So pay attention, pay attention what you're doing there. Right. We're scientists, you know, we're following these prescriptive methods, we're doing these things to put your, to mix together. Out in the field, the concrete finisher is an artisan. He's looking at it, he, every day is different, every mix is different. He's looking at it, you know, basing his decision and his timing on feel, really, and, and experience. So, it's a combination, that's what our, our business is, you know, we, we follow a recipe put it together and bring it to you and then he takes it and does what he feels like this is what I need to do today to give you a successful project. So he, he's the one that's looking at it when the truck gets to the site and he has the, uh, the, the driver um, send a little bit down the chute, he'll grab it in his hand and squeeze it and he'll say well I need some more water or you know it's, uh, it's a little too wet you know and, and it, that comes from his experience. Right? He knows who's got to put down what it's got to be like and that's where they make adjustments on site. Um, so, so just quickly, I mean, are, are cracks necessarily a bad thing? I mean, if you have a cracked um, garage slab or you have a cracked walk, it I mean, does it does it need to get torn up and replaced? I mean, it's... concrete cracks are rarely structural. Unfortunately, they're unsightly. Um, again, concrete is at its largest volume when it's poured; it will shrink and crack. Not every time, right. most of the time it will. So we cut joints in it. You can either trowel them in on the plastic concrete. A controlled joint is a fourth mm -hmm. of the- Fourth to a third. The, the, depth, the depth, depth of the of joint the has to be a fourth of the thickness of the slab to be effective. So if you just put a little score top, a little, you know, pretty, pretty lines in see. across the top of the concrete, because you'll see that, you'll see this, you know, here's my joint and here's the crack in the concrete right next to it. Typically, it's just not deep enough. So if you're pouring a four inch slab, you need to have one inch Correct. Deep. Okay. Exactly. Okay. And, yeah. and these folks that, that tool in one and it, you know, it's not a quarter, a, <laughs> a quarter inch groove. I mean, a, a one inch groove into the concrete is a big groove, but yeah. I've seen it right. done and, and it can be done and needs to be done. Um, most, most, Every time we see this, it's not, it's just, they're not deep enough, you know? They just make, they're making a mark, so, yeah. Clearly, um, how we treat it after it is put down initially um, is, it sounds like the most important thing that we can do, um, you know, to protect the uh, evaporation, all right, so it doesn't evaporate too fast, or we want to keep water in it uh, to allow it to cure over time, right? The, it's the, the curing that is going to really give us the best finished product. And the more time we allow and the, and the, the proper uh, treatment of it is really going to get us the results <coughs> we're looking for. It really is. There's, there's a, a lot to it. As, as John said, you know, if we could suspend this, this concrete in its plastic state to it harden, where it's not touching anything, it's gonna, it's gonna, the water's gonna leave it, it's gonna contract, and it's gonna stay in all in one piece. But that's not how it is. We have constraints. You have constraints on your walls. You've got the footer there that's constrained. You've got the vertical, uh, horizontal bars there that are holding that, they're constricting that. So, so uh, walls that, that crack a little bit, they're, they're nothing to worry about. It, sh it should happen there. Um, so, you know, um, cracks are going to happen. Joints are the biggest place to, to try to pick that up. And, and most concrete, concrete finishers should know where 
where to pick up those uh, joints and how to run them and everything. And if they don't, they can contact uh, uh, their producer and, and try to try to get a little help with, with that, you know, to alleviate some of these cracks. I know salesmen um, <coughs> and, uh, and quality control reps for your companies um, are valuable assets and, and I also will admit we probably don't use them as often as we should because um, they know a great deal and obviously they know more than we do and uh, can be you know helpless at the end of the day get to a better finished product which is what we're all looking for. And there are a ton of really good resources online. Absolutely. ACI has some great information. Um, ACI is the American Concrete Institute, the NRMCA, the National Ready Mix Concrete Association, um, Virginia. Yeah, the Virginia Ready Mix Concrete Association. There's just right. a, a lot of information designed um, for the contractor. There's, um, there's information that you can hand the homeowner. You can set it out on your counter in your model home that describes concrete and you know talks about concrete cracking and just says just those kind of things. It's not structural, you know. Don't panic. I mean, it doesn't mean that you have failing concrete in your driveway if you have a crack. Uh, right. Any parting advice, um, anything that uh, you want to share with us that we need to think about as we go forward? Um, I would just say just the kind of um, recap what we talked about. It's never really too cold to pour concrete. It's never really too hot to pour concrete. As long as you're taking the proper precautions, as long as you're looking at the, 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 what the challenges are going to be and you're preparing for them. Wet the sub base, cool the sub base. Um, wind breaks on, on a day, I'm just looking out, it looks like the wind's blowing a little bit, a wind break will help. Just do it and not allow that wind to rush across the surface, surface of the concrete. Yep. Um, evaporation retardants like Keith talked about and just um, water in general. Now it's never good to finish that water back in. Don't spray it and then get your trowel machine on there because now you're weakening the surface. Um, but again, it, it, it's never too hot or cold to do to pour concrete. Might be hard for us to get it to you, you know, because we're dealing with water, we're dealing with, with air uh, at the plant. So when it gets cold, wintertime concrete is, is not fun. It, it is not fun. And, uh, you know, so we get it on the truck. Now we got to get it from point A to point B without the truck freezing up, which uses water and air. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a challenge. Wintertime is, is not fun. So. Well, the good news is we're almost through it. That's uh, right. That's right. Another, another Close. 12 months. Yeah. Close. Let's right. go. Well, well, John and Keith, I thank you both for uh, sitting down with us this morning. Um, thank you again for being members of our association and appreciate your wisdom. Thank you all. Oh, Thanks thank for having us. We appreciate it. It's been an honor.